Hey, 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 guys. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Journey to Purpose with me, Erica Lasan. And I am super glad that you are here for this week's episode because this week I'll be doing a little bit of a resume rundown, highlighting some of the top jobs that I've taken in the past and how they actually did me a favor by helping me find the joy and fulfillment that I desired, even in the moments when I least expected it. So if you are currently at a job that you cannot stand, make sure you keep listening through to the very end because later on in the episode, I will also be highlighting some upcoming events and how a journey to purpose can help you journey to the job of your dreams. Now, if you are currently working a job that you hate, Trust me, I have been there. If you listened to last week's episode where I talked about how all of this was once a dream, I took time to really detail how I even ended up on a journey to purpose and what the catalyst was. But what I didn't share with you in that episode was, though that was the first time that I cried over a job that I could not stand, It most certainly was not the last time. (laughs) So in today's episode, I'm going to be sharing some of my crazy past job experiences and detailing how they unexpectedly led me to my career path of creating my own company, Journey to Purpose. Throughout this episode, I'll also be sharing what I gained from each career opportunity, even the crappy ones, and how you can use some solutions that I'll be sharing to help you evaluate your own career journey. I'm going to lounge a little bit for this because we are diving into story time. I don't know that I was ever someone who ever really felt as though I was meant to be working for other people because I remember thinking of ways that I could make more money like as an elementary schooler okay. I I say more money like I was making money already because I most certainly was not. Our summer vacations, and while most kids were outside playing on the playground or outside riding their bikes, I was thinking of things that I could do to create some cash. I remember at one point contemplating starting a lemonade stand because that's something that I'd seen a lot. though I don't know who in my neighborhood would have bought it. I remember at one point considering mowing other people's lawns even though we didn't have a lawnmower. And I even remember thinking about setting up car washes. When I was 13, my first big break as far as financial independence came very unexpectedly. And it came in the form of illegal child labor. (laughs) Okay, so I'm kidding. Kind of. Technically, I don't know if it was actually child labor because it was voluntary. I did choose to work with this woman, but um, I do say that it was kind of illegal because in the state of Maryland, um, which is where I was living, I grew up in Baltimore, you weren't really able to work until you were 16. I think at that point there was some type of a rule or something where you could be 15 and nine months, um, but you had to have a working permit. And at 13, nobody was handing those out so um, at 13 years old I started working with this woman who owned her own jewelry line her own jewelry company called beads by Bonnie and at 13 I was rolling in the money okay even though I was technically working for her illegally (laughs) by the law standards I was being compensated very well Miss Bonnie was a woman of her word and she paid me $10 an hour. Let me tell you, that was some good money. I met her at a holiday craft fair and she was crying as she was setting up her table because she was very overwhelmed. And I just happened to be walking around with my friend and I saw this woman crying. I didn't know why she was crying, but anytime I see anybody crying, it makes me feel a certain type of way. I'm empathetic like that. And so I remember telling my friend, I would catch up with her that I was going to see what was up with this lady. And um, in that time when I spoke with her, she was just like, I have so much stuff to set up and I don't know how I'm going to do this. I later on found out that she gets very anxious. And so I told her not to worry. I would help her set everything up. And I just did it. I helped her set up her table. And then once I was done, I told her I'd circle back after um, I'd done a couple of loops around the craft fair. Because remember, this was just me spending my Saturday at school for fun. And so I did a couple of loops and then I came back and I checked on her as promised. And later on that afternoon, when I came by just to say bye, because the craft fair was over, she offered me a summer job, which was crazy. And later on that summer, 
I began to work with Miss Bonnie. It started off as a summer gig where I was helping her clean out her basement because she was moving and she gave me a bunch of beads um, and she also had me working on this type of jewelry that she was making something that she created on her own and I helped her make it and then she would give me a portion or a commission from each of the pieces that I'd made so not only did Miss Bonnie compensate me well for my time and just showing up to help her but she also taught me about making a commission this is a lesson that I started gaining at 13 which now that I think about it really blows my mind so I worked with Miss Bonnie for a couple of summers until she moved to Fredericksburg Maryland which was very sad for me because it was then too far for me to go um, meet with her every summer because I didn't have a car at that point because remember, I was only 13. Fun fact, Jada Pinkett Smith used to work for Miss Bonnie as well. She always spoke about how she had an eye for talent and knowing um, people that were going places in their lives. So I hope that someday, <laughs> or even now that I've lived up to Miss Bonnie's expectations. Um, but working with her was a really, really amazing opportunity and taught me a lot of really important things that I'll be sharing more details about later on in the episode. The next job I worked was at a shoe store called Naturalizer. And this was actually around the time that I was about to turn 16. And Naturalizer was one of the only stores in the entire mall that would hire me at 15 um, and some change. <laughs> if you guys don't know about Naturalizer, they are a shoe brand that sells like comfy ortho, well, they're not orthotics per se, but they are shoes <laughs> that look like they're on the um, old person shoe side, like they aren't the cutest shoes, but they are very practical shoes and they have really nice insoles. So they're comfortable shoes. <laughs> and as glad as I was for them giving me the opportunity, Naturalizer was not the sexiest place to work and it was not the place that I wanted to be long term. I grabbed my resume with my new sales experience and I went in search of higher ground and more colorful, creative and youthful experience. <laughs> and with this, I started working at Forever 21. Forever 21 was the place for me at the time that I was working there. And it was the first job that I felt like I really belonged and I I loved my coworkers. I loved the space. I learned a lot. Um, and I actually worked at Forever 21 for two years. The summer going into my freshman year of college and the first summer back from college. So going into my sophomore year. Um, and I remember really loving the experience, but I think at one point I just got tired of stuffing the racks with all of their merchandise. Like there was so much all the time. So I took my resume in my new experience and the fact that I was actually of legal age to work and I hit Towson Town Center in search of new work opportunities. I remember applying to Abercrombie and Fitch because it kind of gave me nostalgia a bit. Um, I went to a predominantly white private school and I just remember there was a point where everybody was wearing Abercrombie and Fitch. There was that song that came out, I can't remember who it's by. I like girls that wear Abercrombie and Fitch. I'm thinking if I had one wish, cause she's been gone since last summer, since last summer. You guys remember that song? Well, after that song came out, everybody was wearing Abercrombie and Fitch. <laughs> My classmates all had Abercrombie and Fitch outfits. I could not afford Abercrombie and Fitch, nor were my parents gonna give me Abercrombie and Fitch money. Um, but I just remember thinking like, man, Abercrombie and Fitch is so cool. So when I could look for a job, that was one of the places that I'd applied to. And I did get the job and I worked there for all of 24 hours. <laughs> Let me explain. The job was in the stock room and I didn't want to be in the stock room. Not only that, but Abercrombie did not pay very well. I think they were paying like just about minimum wage, if I remember correctly. I just remember thinking that it was insane that they barely paid their employees um, or at least paying them well, considering how much their clothes cost. And not only that, I later found out within the time that I had taken that job that I was being offered another job at Aeropostale. And I don't even know if I'd completed that orientation. I may have left the orientation. <laughs> the orientation shift to go downstairs for my first shift at Aeropostale. 
And I remember taking the job because um, Aeropostale, though it wasn't quite as sexy, they offered a really good discount for employees. But more importantly, they were offering me an opportunity to work on the sales floor. Because if you have ever worked retail, you know the stock room is not sexy. I mean, really, who would want all of this? All of this personality to be stuck behind closed doors when you could have it facing and interacting with your customers, right? So I took the job at Aeropostale and I loved it. I ended up working at Aeropostale for two years. I worked there through my junior year of college and I left Aeropostale because my friend got me a job at Red Lobster. <laughs> My friend Sheena at the time, of the group of eight of us, um, my eight college friends, she was the one who was always rolling in money. And there was a period where she got literally almost everybody in our crew a job at Red Lobster. I think of the eight of us, at one point, there were at least four or five of us working at Red Lobster. It was a really fun time. But on top of that, I made buku dollars, okay? I was making so much money. I remember thinking like, goodness, if I can make up to $200 a night working one to two shifts a week, being a server, like, what am I getting a degree for again? Just kidding. I was definitely still gonna get my degree <laughs> because at one point I got very tired of serving people. And that was actually one of the last jobs that I worked before I had my first corporate experience, which was working at a marketing agency called Warm Thoughts. <laughs> I got this internship my junior year leading into my senior year. And I continued to work there for about, I wanna say three years as well. Um, oftentimes when I speak about that period of my life where I was crying every day at work, it was at Warm Thoughts. But it didn't start off that way. I really enjoyed working there while it was an internship, um, while I was in college. But after I obtained my degree and I quickly saw that I wasn't seen as full-time employee potential, that means getting a raise, that means being promoted, that means getting benefits. Now that I have this four-year degree and being that you, you know, the organization knew me very well, it really did leave me feeling unfulfilled. This is the point where I really began to go on my joy quest. And I ended up working at this boutique called Kalalilai in the city, um, New York City. And it was at a period in my life where I really just wanted to do something completely different. And at this point, I really didn't even care about making a ton of money. I just wanted to work in an area and a space where I felt fulfilled, where I felt creative, and where I could meet some really cool people. And Kalalilai hit that on all fronts. I worked at Kali Live for two years, gained a bunch of experience, but in addition to this, I also started doing my own thing. And by my own thing, I mean I got back into making jewelry again, I started doing freelance work, I started working with magazines, I started doing on-air hosting within that time. So this span of time, the, that two to three years while I was working at Kali Live really opened me up for self-discovery and anchoring myself in my joy. And so from there, I left to work at Zara to be a visual merchandiser. I hated the experience. Oh my goodness. I don't think I was at Zara for more than six months. And by month three, that same feeling that I had of crying at work every day became a thing at Zara. I remember clocking in for my shifts at like 4 or 5 a.m. And the first 10 minutes of my shift, I would be in the bathroom crying. And then I'd have to clean my face and then I'd have to go and do my floor sets. It absolutely wasn't what I expected the experience to be. From there, I went to unemployed freelance life. <laughs> and within this time, I really started to brand myself as a creator and establish myself as a freelancer. Thanks to the fact that I'd been working on my own stuff leading up to that point, I was actually able to make a good amount of money doing my own thing. And from that period, I went into doing promo modeling. Now, this was a really fun part of my journey where I was selling liquor. <laughs> if you have ever been to a liquor store where there's a girl there holding a bottle, pouring drinks and telling you, hey, would you like to sample this? That was me. 
I was that person. And I was working with brands like Jack Daniels and Absolute Vodka and um, Bacardi. It was a really, really fun time. So in addition to working at the liquor stores, they also had events. So I would work at clubs. I would work at private events. I would work on golf courses where I could get tipped. And they compensated very well. It was like 25 bucks an hour. So at that period of time, I was really just enjoying my freedom, me meeting new people and only having to work like, I don't know, maybe f six to eight hours a week. And in the rest of the week, I could do the things that I wanted. But um, at some point, when I found out that I was pregnant, that was obviously something I couldn't do anymore. And then I got a little worried about the possibility of making money because if you're working at these liquor stores, nobody's going to want to see a pregnant lady. <laughs> selling legal liquor like that I don't even know if that's legal or it just wasn't a good look I felt like I was now at this point where I really had to consider um, adulting and being a good parent and to me at the time I thought that meant getting a job in corporate because I could no longer pursue the things that brought me joy I detailed all of this in last week's episode so if you're wondering a little bit more about that time and that process you definitely want to check that out this is where I got really serious about my future as a mom and finding an office job I got referred for a job opportunity by my friend Danielle to work at a place called SD Ventures. It was the first time that I'd worked a desk job where I actually spoke to them about the things that I wanted to do so that I could bring those gifts and that talent to their space. But it was also a really nerve wracking time because again, I was pregnant. And I'd found out that I was pregnant the week that I went in for that job interview. So, not only was I looking for a job, I was nervous about getting the job. I got the job, but then I was nervous to tell them that I was pregnant because I was afraid I would lose the job. And in, <laughs> so for about a good four months, well, first of all, I found out that I was pregnant when I was almost three months pregnant. I didn't know. But once I did find out, I kept it a secret for about two and a half months because I was trying to make it through the probation period so that I was an official employee and if they fired me then I would have grounds for I don't know I don't want to say taking legal action because I would hope that they wouldn't fire me simply because I was pregnant but it was a consideration I didn't want to lose my job simply because I was going to be a mom but then I also learned that they didn't really have any maternity privileges they were a small business in theory um, based on the New York office but it was a business that was international because their headquarters were in Russia so they actually had like a lot of employees it was just the New York office was very small and they also ran a dating site and a couple of other things it was really weird I'll talk a little bit more about that later but the point was they didn't have anything set up for women who were going to give birth. They didn't have any type of policy set up for maternity, maternity leave, um, or employees who were having children. And so that brought me some other worry because um, it felt like my job could be on the line. But then I also had to take all of this time and energy <laughs> to work with human resources to kind of figure out what my path would be as far as keeping my work once I did tell them that I was pregnant. That was an experience in and of itself. Um, and maybe actually I'll share that in a future podcast episode. If you'd like to learn more about that, let me know in the comments wherever you are listening to this or send me a message. I worked at SDV for about 15 months. Um, so it worked out fine. I had Aria. I took my maternity leave. But about four months after I came back to work full time, they decided to slowly let people go <laughs> and it started off kind of as a trickle until it felt like a gushing wave and they went from a total of having 18 employees to then like having four and I was one of the last to go but I thought that it was actually okay timing because again Mind you, I had a four month old baby. So with this, I decided to take on the responsibility of being a full time stay at home mom. And I thought it was going to be one way. 
and it turned out to be a completely different way. I've highlighted that. I've shared that um, a little bit about that on past podcast episodes, namely the one called The Juggle is Real. I think that's episode four or five. But it was in that time that I really got clear about what had been working up to that point and what it was that I really wanted to do with life moving forward. And it did not look like simply staying at home and being a full-time mom forever and ever and ever. (laughs) And it was in this time that I really decided that I wanted to go for my dreams. Like I really wanted to establish myself as a creative. And with this, I branded myself and my site, ericalassan.com. And I did this for about two years. Um, until we had our second child, Jace. (laughs) And at this point, I was like, being a stay-at-home mom is cool, but at this point, I really just want to make money. (laughs) So I went on another search, another job search, now that the kids were old enough, being three and one. And with this, I found the job well, though. This was a contracted position that felt at the moment like the job of my dreams. I actually spoke a little bit about what actually happened from this experience in episode, I wanna say 11, um, Life and Lemonade, if you guys have listened to that episode. And that was basically the last straw for me. And after that, I founded my own company, Journey to Purpose. As you can tell, I've gone through a lot of experiences, as I'm sure you have as well. And each of these work experiences taught me a lot. There was so much to glean from every opportunity, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So after this brief break, I'll be sharing with you what I gained from each experience and how working in each of these places actually put me on path for my purpose. So make sure you keep listening because... After that, I'll be sharing some solutions that you can apply to your career journey and helping you find a path of purpose as well. Quick question. Do you wish that you had the confidence and the discipline to use your creative gifts to create a life that is more fulfilling and purpose propelled? Or maybe you are just plain old over it. And by it, I mean everything. If you answered yes to one or maybe all of these things, I'm here to help you dream again. I would like to invite you to join me for a 90 minute masterclass for women and entrepreneurs who want a roadmap to feeling less overwhelmed, less overworked, and more connected to their dreams and goals. You'll walk away from this Journey to Dream masterclass with clarity around how to craft a vision that produces an unapologetically beautiful life that is grounded in joy, improving your relationships, your career, your wellness, and even your finances. You'll benefit from this masterclass no matter where you are in life, or even if you're unsure of what your purpose is, whether you're a college graduate that's looking to find work, a stay-at-home mom who's looking to rediscover yourself and your identity outside of your children, or maybe you're even at a point in your career where you're switching career paths or you're ready to enter retirement and you're just unsure of what it is that you want to do next. The best years are ahead of you and if you've lost sight of how to get there, I am here to help you rediscover your freedom and joy. If this sounds like something that you may be interested in, please visit the link shared below or somewhere around this screen up here down there in a comment box somewhere and register for this free masterclass where i will teach you how to journey to your dreams again by creating a system of how you can change your life through joy i hope to see you there but until then i hope that you remember that we're on this journey together one feel good thing at a time I'll catch you in class. Hey guys, we are back and we are also inside because hashtag mom life. I had to go pick Aria up from school. It got late after the playground time. I was like, you know what? We're going to come inside and finish up this episode. So here we are. I'm going to be sharing with you all of the lessons that I gained from working at these numerous jobs. Here we go. So the first job I mentioned to you guys was working at Beats by Bonnie. And one of the greatest lessons that I gained from working with Miss Bonnie is that I had creative skills. I had an eye for design and it was possible for me to make some money, good money, (laughs) especially at such a young age, doing things that I actually enjoyed. It was the first time that I really began to understand that working in an office wasn't the only answer to living an adult life. 
and and being able to create income. Mrs. Bonnie was a woman who traveled the world, got to meet new people, try new things, see new things, and she was also able to utilize her gifts and her ability to see things to create her reality. And I would learn that a lot of the things that she would create were inspired from her travels. So she had a bunch of cloisonne beads at one point. She was like, oh yeah, those were from my travels to China. <laughs> and then at another point, I noticed that she had these little uh, coins. Actually, that's what inspired the jewelry that you're seeing here. I, I made this jewelry. I don't know how many of you guys know this, but I started off as a jewelry designer. Actually, you probably know this because you've been listening to this episode, right? Right. <laughs> well, um, these Chinese coins were inspired by some coins that I saw when I was working with Miss Bonnie. The second lesson that I learned as I went into working <laughs> as a young adult was from Naturalizer. What I learned from that experience at not even 16 years old was that I was a pretty good salesperson. I was killing the commission. Oh my goodness, I was walking around with so many pairs of those old people's shoes <laughs> because I sold pretty well. Um, after that, once I got to Forever 21, what I learned from that experience was how to give great customer service. Treating people the way that you'd want to be treated. I learned from working at Forever 21, um, when I go places, to show the same respect to other people no matter where they are on the totem pole of their job or their life, whatever the case is. Basically treating people with decency and respect. Um, so now even as a person who no longer works in retail, whenever I go to a store and I try things on, I put them back on the hanger. I'm the person that's bringing the hanger out to you. I will put it on the rack. And if I can, I will put it exactly where I got it from. Just because I know what that life is like. And I also make sure to smile at people and ask them about their day as they're going about their business, running this business for the companies that they work for. Because ultimately, people are people and they're deserving of respect. I'm also that person that's at a restaurant cleaning up the table. <laughs> Um, before the server comes so that they can take things away easily and I'll explain why in a little bit. But in this time while I was working at Forever 21, I also learned a lot about product placement and floor sets and I learned a lot about the psychology behind shopping. This isn't something that I'd ever really considered but I remember there was a very specific soundtrack that was played at Forever 21. And I later learned that it was the same soundtrack that was played at all of the stores. And I learned about the order in which the songs played and why certain songs were selected, um, the spacing of the clothes, why the sales were done at a certain time of the year, um, why certain racks were more stuffed than others. Like all of these things play on our psychology as customers. And it was while working at Forever 21 that I really began to pay attention to these things. It wasn't something that they told us. It's not like they were giving us a lot of um, insight into these things, but I was very curious about them, so I made sure to ask because, I mean, why not? The next thing I learned was from Abercrombie & Fitch, you know, that place where I was only there for about 24 hours, <laughs> was to value my worth and to not do things solely because of how they look. Like I mentioned to you guys, I took that job at Abercrombie & Fitch because of status. I thought that it would look a certain type of way. But what I learned from not taking the Abercrombie & Fitch job is that you should also look for things other than how much you're gonna be getting paid at each job. I think that aside from the financial piece of Abercrombie just not paying their people very well, the thing that really made me want to take the job at Aeropostel was the fact that it was more aligned with my long-term goals. I knew that I didn't want to stay in the stock room. I ultimately knew that I am a type of person that enjoys talking to other people. I wanted to be on the sales floor. So that was kind of a no-brainer for me where even if I was only getting paid 25 cents more, I still would have gone to Aeropostel just because I didn't want to go to a place where I would hate being every day. <laughs> Which brings me to my position at Aeropostel. And what I learned in that space and that time frame was that the people that you work with really make a difference. In the two or three years that I was working at Aeropostel, the time flew by. And I actually really enjoyed working there, both at the location in Towson um, to the point where 
even when I was back at school at FDU, when I came back to New Jersey, I asked for a transfer so that I could work at the Aeropostale at Garden State Plaza because I enjoyed the company culture so much. But I felt as though the management was just really good at Aeropostale. So I stayed there for a really long time until I realized I wanted to make more money, which brought me to Red Lobster. And while I was at Red Lobster, I learned a ton. And it was here that I really sharpened my customer service skills because if you have ever been a server if you have ever worked at a restaurant where you were waiting on people then you know that this is a skill that you must have okay <laughs> I mean you don't necessarily want to be the person that's singing for your tips but um, what I learned here was how to use my personality to my advantage and with this um, understanding that the more people like you, the more likely they are to invest in you in some way. Because obviously, if you give good customer service, that's one thing. But if you give good customer service and the people that you're serving like you, you get a better tip. And it was in that space that I really learned to control my emotions, even if there was a table that was a little difficult or a table that didn't necessarily um, make the experience of serving them a great one, I learned to deliver customer service with a smile. And I also learned how to navigate around disappointment when engaging with other people, understanding that sometimes people will treat you a certain type of way solely based on your status. There was this one incident where I got a dollar and 50 cent tip. I don't even know if it was up to a dollar and 50 cent and it was all in coins. Like there were some pennies thrown in there maybe a nickel, a couple of dimes. There definitely was not a dollar bill. It was all in coins. And I remember um, after the table left and I opened up the thing and I saw the tip, I remember just sitting down and crying. <laughs> I don't know if you guys can tell, but when I feel something, I feel it hard. Not just because of the fact that they left me such a crappy tip after spitting, spending so much of their time sitting at my table. And if you guys don't know about waiting tables, the longer people sit down and have their meals, that's the more time that they are taking up in your shift, which means your tables aren't getting rotated as often. So if a custom, so if a family comes in and they spend a whole lot of time sitting at your table, that's now one less turnover that you have to make more money. The people that came and sat down during this shift of mine sat there for so long. Like they must have been there for at least two hours. That was like half of my shift. So that day I made like no money. And I just remember feeling like I'd wasted so much of my time. But I also remember feeling very strongly about how they must view me as a person that they would leave me this dollar fifty tip in coins. It played on my feelings a little bit. So I learned a lot from my experience at Red Lobster. I I also learned to care for <laughs> servers when I do go out to eat. It's not often that we go out. When we do, I'm always the person that's making sure the table is neat so that they can carry the plates away with dignity because I just know what it feels like to be in that position. Next up is warm thoughts. And what I learned from working at Warm Thoughts is that I hated working in offices. And it was in this space that I learned that I really needed to be surrounded by color and creativity. I really enjoy working with creative people and being, collabor and being in a collaborative space. And I also learned from this position that I really value opportunities for creative expression where my ideas can be used and valued, which brings me to Kalalee Lai. Now, Kalalee Lai was the space and the place where I found my joy again. It was here that I learned to trust myself again and to understand that my creative intuition could serve me and serve me well. It was in this same space that I started to revisit the things that I enjoyed doing as a young person before I 
put all my childish things aside to pursue more grown and adult-like things when I left for college. I started making jewelry again. I started doing photography again. I, it was at this time that I also created my YouTube channel and got into on-air hosting, um, which led to amazing opportunities working with Ebony Magazine and Juicy Magazine. And it was also in this frame of time that I realized that I could be a boss. One day I was wearing one of my pieces and a customer walked by and was like, oh, do you guys sell that here? And I was like, no, we don't. I made this. And she was like, oh my goodness, that's so cute. Um, can I buy it? And I was like, there's only one and I'm wearing it because I still made one off pieces. And she was like, oh no, I'll definitely take it. And she was like, how much is it? And this piece took me a really long time to make because they were made by individual links. Um, it was chain mail, it was a chain mail necklace. And when I mentioned this to the woman and I was explaining like all of the reasons why this piece was so much, in my mind though, I was trying to calculate how much I should actually charge her given the amount of time that it took me to make it. And I stated the price, $150, and then I held my breath and I didn't blink. And the woman was like, okay, sold. <laughs> and she bought the piece straight off my neck. If that wasn't a game changer, you guys, after that, I was like, oh, yes, I definitely need to be selling my stuff in the stores. So I took the time to ask for what I wanted. And that was something else that I learned while working at Kalalilai. You don't get if you don't ask. There were so many parts of my growth in that company that wouldn't have taken place if I wouldn't have simply asked for what I wanted. I wanted a promotion, I wanted to sell my jewelry in the store, I wanted to try different things. At one point I remember asking them if I could sing around the holidays. Uh, <laughs> they paid me to sing in the window to attract new people. And this was back in like 2011 to 2013. So social media was still just starting to take off. And I remember pitching to them running their social media. And this was one of the first experiences where I kind of pitched myself as a creative or a content creator. And so part of my job was to create the social media for Kalalilai. I also remember pitching an opportunity for me to do street interviews for Kalalilai, which actually also piggybacked on what I was doing personally anyway, where I was conducting street interviews for my YouTube channel. Do you guys see what I'm doing here? I took every opportunity to really hone in on the things that I wanted to do and really creating opportunities to see where I could layer my joy <laughs> in bringing my joy and my purpose together, even if it was in a space where I was collecting a check. Because ultimately, any opportunity where you get to use your gifts and your talents is an opportunity where you get to shine. But sometimes it just takes you asking for an opportunity to do just that. Had I not done that, there would have been a whole opportunity lost, not only for me, myself as a creative, um, and the growth that was experienced in that time frame, but the opportunity would have been lost from the place where I was working as well, Kalalilai, getting an opportunity to have new creative out of the box ideas being given to them. 23 was a good year. That was the year that I got this tattoo and this signifies a lot for me. Those were really good times. Next up was Zara. And what I loved most about the potential for this opportunity was that though the visual merchandisers worked in the stores, they were still considered a corporate position. So the assumption for me, and you know what they say about assumptions, was that I'd be getting paid very well. That is not the case when you are a Zara visual merchandiser. But I took the opportunity anyway because I was looking forward to growth. But let me tell y'all, oh my goodness, the probationary and trial period for working there was just not fun for me. It was not fun for me. It was not fun for me. It was not fun for me. And I also learned very quickly that I don't deal well in places where there is a social hierarchy based on people wanting to feel like they're important. And I think that that is something that the fashion industry does very well. And <laughs> a lot of times I just remember working in Zara and looking at some of the people who were coming in on the visual side of things like the corporate management. I remember just feeling like 
it's not that serious. You're not a doctor and this is not life or death. But the way that people carried themselves while working there just really gave other people an air of feeling really crappy and cruddy about themselves if they were not at a certain level within the company. Anyway, I say all this to say that from that time, I learned to trust God. And I also learned that God knows what is best. And that sometimes the things that you are expecting from an experience aren't all that it's cracked up to be. After about six months of working with Zara, they decided to let me go, which was actually fine by me because at that point I was crying every day on the job Anyway, since I'd been spending so much time working at Zara and due to the crazy hours that I was working at Zara, I had to be there at like 5 a.m. most days, especially the days when we were doing floor sets. And I would get out at three or four, but I was so tired from getting up that I didn't have enough energy to really pursue my other creative endeavors. So I took being unemployed as a blessing. (sighs) Are you guys still with me? We're almost done, but promo modeling. I shared with you guys that promo modeling was a really good time for me. In that time, I learned to have fun and the importance of having fun while you work. And I also, in that period, learned how to sharpen my sales skills by doing one very important thing. Listen. (laughs) I learned just how important it is to listen because, I mean, Most of the time when you're going into these places, if you see somebody selling something as you're walking by, you just wanna automatically dismiss them. But if you are listening to what the person is looking for, it's a lot easier for you to then navigate a conversation around how what you're offering can benefit them. And that's what I learned from being a promo model. Now, if you will recall from earlier in this episode, SD Ventures, Social Discovery Ventures, was the first corporate gig that I had post-college, like real actual corporate job where I had to go to an office, clock in, clock out. I got a salary. I had vacation days. It was like a whole thing. And I also got bonuses. It was like a really good deal coming in. But It was in this time frame that I learned how to move in corporate with setting my daily priorities and my tasks, getting organized when handling tasks, especially if I had many tasks or multiple tasks to handle. I also learned the power of having ethics, morals, and integrity when running a business and understanding that everything comes to the light. So the best way to keep business when creating a business is to have an honest business. Now, I'm not gonna go too much into detail, but I will say it was a foreign company. They had a dating service. The dating service required that people pay to speak to other people. This was just one of the many ventures that they had actually. They had a travel one, which was part of the reason why I was really excited about the gig. Um, And they also had a brand that was a men's magazine. It was like a whole thing. So there there were a lot of things to get involved in, but ultimately what it came down to for me in terms of the lessons gained, it was really about the power of having an honest company and transparency. But in addition to this, I also learned the importance of creating a fun company culture. It really goes a long way in building team morale and bringing qualified candidates in to work with you. And that makes a huge difference if you're running a business because your business is only as good as the people that are working in it or the people that are working for you. If you have a great business, but the people who are executing the business and engaging with your clients and customers leave much to be desired, or if they're not pleasant, then odds are you're not gonna continue to get business. (laughs) One thing that SDV did really well was getting really highly qualified candidates in the door, but keeping them was a whole other conversation. Becoming a full-time stay-at-home mom. And the reason why I am sharing this is because being a full-time stay-at-home parent is a job. I highly believe that being a stay-at-home parent should be a thing that people include on their resume because you learn so much 
<laughs> you learned so much. A lot of them revolved around things like multitasking, getting better with prioritizing time management, though, you know, that's always a work in progress. <laughs> I learned a lot about patience, having effective communication, the importance of having clarity and prioritizing your day and the things that you're gonna be doing each day. And I also learned that, drum roll please, moms don't get paid enough <laughs> because we don't get paid at all. But understanding the importance and the significance that being a parent plays on the lives of your children and understanding that while you aren't being compensated to be home with your children, you play a very important role in just creating good citizens of the world and society, and that's a really important role. So yes, I've included it as a part of this resume rundown. It was in this time that I also started my blog, Live Rich Mommy, which I kept going for about two years before I stopped in pursuit of other things. I wasn't making money doing it, which is, again, a conversation for another day. Um, and also why I preach the importance of understanding your purpose when you are doing anything and how your joy aligns with your purpose. Because while I was passionate about the blog, and blogging wasn't necessarily the best avenue for me. Like I was good at it, it was something that could be done, but it didn't bring me joy. And there is something to be said about pursuing things that bring you joy because then it brings you sustainable success. I think I may do a podcast episode about that later on as well, because I think that that's a conversation that needs to be had when it comes to entrepreneurship. So stay tuned. Next up was Wellville. And while I was working at Wellville, I learned, and this was a big one, because Wellville, remember, was the last job that I took before deciding to bet on myself <laughs> in building this company, Journey to Purpose. But what I learned from Wellville was that a leader without an established vision and a mission isn't much of a leader at all. Another thing that I learned while working at Wellville, and this was a super valuable lesson for me, being a visionary and somebody who wants to also DIY everything, <laughs> If you are a leader with a vision and a strong mission that other people can get behind, you will be able to hire the smartest people needed to do the job. So you don't necessarily have to be good at all the things, but if you're clear on your vision, if you can effectively communicate that vision and that mission to other people who are very smart and have the skills that are needed in order for you to execute that vision and mission, then your business will be good to go. Um, and I also learned that money doesn't necessarily solve a lack of purpose or integrity when running a business because karma is a bee. And if you are not <laughs> leading your business with integrity, um, it is very hard to sustain success. Um, and ultimately, you just get found out. Keep a paper trail and document when things feel weird. Um, and with this, I also learned to trust my instincts. So this was, again, one of those weird work experiences that started off great, didn't end great, but I learned a lot from that experience that I have taken with me into this part of my entrepreneurial journey, which finally brings me to starting a journey to purpose. Almost exactly two years ago, I launched my first vision casting workshop. And what I've learned within this two year period is that entrepreneurship is not a walk in the park, okay? <laughs> I'd been doing a lot of entrepreneurial things since I was 13 years old. So yes, it's been a course of 20 years, but I think a lot of times people hear about entrepreneurship and all of the benefits that can come with owning your own business. like being able to set your time and your calendar however you want, not having to answer to anybody else, being able to make your own decisions, waking up when you want, kind of, um, and really just leading this boss-like life. But there are so many parts of entrepreneurship that aren't shared, and I think that being an entrepreneur is highly glamorized, but unless you are doing certain things every day and on a consistent basis um, so that you're experiencing growth, it can be said that you are playing business. And what I learned once I really decided to go for it in terms of not applying for any more jobs and really starting to pursue, 
full-time entrepreneurship, I learned that for a good portion <clears throat> of the time that I've been doing entrepreneurial things, I'd been playing business because I liked the way that it sounded. And it wasn't until I finally invested in myself um, and in getting some mentorship and guidance that I learned the difference between the two. Um, and with this, I learned that sometimes you have to spend money to make money. And I'm not just talking about spending money on things so that you can do whatever is necessary for your business. Like, I don't know, buying a computer or buying materials to make jewelry, because that's also a thing. But sometimes investing in people is really necessary in order to guide you in saving you time, energy, and tons of money in the process, along with a ton of headaches and a lot of heartache. Because <laughs> let me tell you something, running a business can be an emotional roller coaster running a business can be an emotional roller coaster and this is something that is not spoken about often enough but trust and believe there will be a whole podcast episode dedicated to this coming in a few weeks so if you aren't subscribed to the podcast you definitely want to do that if you want to learn more about the entrepreneurial journey because trust it is a journey. <laughs> but through all of this, the biggest lesson that I've gained from so far in this entrepreneurial journey is that I can do hard things, but I can only do hard things with faith. <laughs> this process, this journey really requires a lot of trust of self, trust of in God and something bigger than you and really trusting that the purpose that you're called for and called to is worth pursuing. Because if you are not able to hold on to that, if you don't have that to, to grasp onto, then pursuing full-time entrepreneurship can be a very... I don't know how to say it, like self-defeating task because <laughs> there's just so much that's involved in the process. But trust and faith coupled with some joy and purpose really does make all of the difference. So those are all of the things that I've learned from all of the jobs that I've had over the past 20 years, good, bad, and ugly. Now that I've given you my resume rundown, I want to give you some solutions and understanding how all of this information, and I know that I've said a lot right now, how all of this information can serve you in your pursuit of purpose as you journey to a career of your dreams. For today's solutions, I am actually going to share them in the form of three questions. There are three questions that I believe you should ask yourself as you look for new opportunities or when you're taking an offer for a potential gig. When you consider these three questions that I'm about to share, it will help you best align your joy <laughs> with the opportunity, and it'll also help you understand how the opportunity really puts you on path for a life of purpose. So the first question I want you to consider is, how does this opportunity play into my overall vision and the direction that I desire for my life? And I think that this is really important to consider because a lot of times when people are taking jobs or looking for jobs, the first thing that they are considering and it is sometimes the biggest consideration in the types of jobs that people will apply for is how much money they're going to be making. But what good <laughs> is taking a job, um, even if it pays you really well, if you're going to hate being there every single day <laughs> or if you're going to wake up wishing, goodness, I can't wait till the day is over because you dislike the place where you're working, the coworkers that you're working with, or you feel as though you're wasting your time and your life being there, okay? Because when you consider it, it is coming at a cost. That cost is your life. <laughs> the second question you should ask yourself is, what am I looking to gain from this experience and my time here? And with this, newsflash, the answer cannot simply be money because you can make money anywhere. So you're... Your answer shouldn't solely revolve around money, but understanding how the experience can benefit you in other ways. When I think back to my experience with Kalalilai and leaving the marketing agency, Kalalilai was paying me slightly more um, than what I was making at Warm Thoughts, but what I valued most from that experience was the opportunity for growth. And 
I experienced a lot of growth while there. And not just in terms of the working my way up in the in the company, but I experienced tremendous personal growth in learning how to find my joy again, in learning how to trust myself again, but also in learning and understanding that my gifts and my talents and my ability to create things was a valuable skill. Even if the place where I was at the time, the marketing agency, warm thoughts, <laughs> didn't see it that way. And this brings me to the third question that you can, should consider when taking a job or considering future job opportunities. How will I feel while working here, okay? And don't think too hard about it. This question is really important because I think that a lot of people don't consider how they feel when they are taking jobs because most of their feelings or their thoughts automatically go towards how much money am I going to be making and how am I going to look in this job? Like, how does this look on my resume? And granted, like I've said before, there is value in considering those things as well. But how you feel while you are at work makes a difference. When you think about the day in and day out responsibilities of the role that you're taking on and the requirements, you should really also be considering how it will impact your wellness, how it will impact your relationships, and how it impacts your overall goals. Because all of these things matter, <laughs> especially once you clock out. So as you're considering this last question of how will I feel while working here, don't think too hard about it. And Whatever your immediate reaction is to this question, trust your gut. Your gut exists for a reason, and instinct is a real thing, okay? All right, so now that we've done our solutions, now it is time for me to share some joy gems. The joy gem comes from Proverbs 18, 16, and it says, a man's gifts make room for him and brings him before great men. Basically, if you are skilled, if you are talented, if you are leading with joy and trusting the gifts that you've been given, those very same gifts will bring you before great people. But you have to stay the course. And I say this of all the artists, I say this of the creatives, I say this of the people who are pursuing building a business that solves a problem, even if they don't necessarily know what all the steps are that need to be taken, if you are moving with faith and if you're pursuing that passion, and if that passion is aligned with a gift of yours, understand that your gift will make room for you and it will bring you before good men. You just have to trust and believe that your name is being spoken in rooms that you don't even know of yet because you are destined to do great things. So stay the course continue to pursue the vision with joy. All right. <laughs> the next joy gem comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13, and then verses 16 through 18. And it says, it is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. Since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. This is Paul speaking to the Corinthians. He then continues to say in verse 16, therefore we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is seen is eternal. And this, y'all, <laughs> is a whole word for so many reasons because in this chapter... And in these verses, Paul speaks of faith, understanding that the moment we believe something and the moment we speak it from our mouths, we have the power to create those things. People call it manifestation. People, I mean, I'm one of those people because manifestation is a thing, but I believe in manifesting by faith and trusting in the spirit that's working in us. So since we have that spirit of faith, once you have a spirit of faith, as you believe, so you speak. 
So as you speak, you are then able to create. And with this, you understand that while you may have certain feelings around things, feelings of distrust of yourself or your ability to do the thing, feelings of maybe not being good enough, feelings of maybe not feeling worthy enough of the the pursuits, so whatever the feelings are, you still need to do your best to achieve the vision because the purpose of the vision is eternal. Okay, understanding that if you fix your, your eyes on the things that are seen, the things that are in front of you, your situations, your circumstances, everything that points to the fact that you shouldn't do the thing that you want to do, you'll remain defeated. So the goal isn't to focus on those things, but to really focus on the vision and the vision is created by faith. Focus on the things unseen and understanding that you're doing these things for the eternal glory, okay? Our last joy gem comes from Ephesians 2.10, and it says, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Y'all, I love this verse so much because it basically tells us that we are not made for ourselves and we are not made void of purpose. Every single human being that comes onto this planet is created with a mission, is created with a purpose in mind, has an intention over their life. And we haven't given ourselves the power to do that, but God himself has given us that purpose and even better, he has given us Christ Jesus <laughs> so that we can actually activate that purpose no matter what, okay? Because we come into the world as flawed people. As humans, we're all flawed. We come in born of sin, flawed, all the things. But it is only because of Christ and his sacrifice that we are able to really pursue our purpose, even knowing that we may be less than worthy, even knowing that we may not be fully qualified, even knowing that we don't have all the answers because through Christ, we received the gift of the Holy Spirit. And with that and the promise of eternal life, we are able to then push forward um, in pursuit of the calling and the mission that God has placed on our lives. It literally says right here, for we are God's handiwork. We are made, we are made with purpose which God has prepared in advance for us to do. So if you are doubting your gifts, if you are doubting your skills, if you are doubting your talent, understand that there's nothing to doubt. No part of your life story, no part of your career aspirations, your dreams, your goals, or work experiences, even if you've hated them, is ever a waste. The question is, what is your perspective gonna be? How can you turn your pain into purpose moving forward? Yeah, this has been a long episode, but it was also a really fun one. I hope that you enjoyed listening to it as much as I enjoyed putting it together and doing a little bit of a stroll down memory lane. I hope that this episode helps you in your journey to purpose. And if it does, if you're watching on YouTube, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. And if you're listening to it on an audio streaming platform, I hope that you share it with a friend or a family member or somebody else who you think could benefit from the message. If you do not want to miss out on any of the upcoming goodness that we have in store, make sure you are subscribed to our mailing list. The link for this is shared in the description box below, as well as the show notes. If you'd like to learn a little bit more about me and my journey to purpose, you can follow me on social media at Erica Lassan, but you can also visit the site ericalassan.com. I also hope that you will join us next week as we have our Journey to Dream Masterclass as we get ready to kick off the fall session of our Journey to Purpose Dream Academy. And if you are listening to this episode at a time when the academy is closed, there are links to apply for the next session as well. All of that said, I look forward to seeing you next week as we join you together yet again. And next week, we'll be talking about gaining some big bomb energy, okay? And when I say bomb energy, I mean B-O-M, betting on me energy. Shout out to my friend, Casey Richardson, who, 
<laughs> who put that term on my radar. And until then, guys, I look forward to joining with you again next week. And remember, we are on this journey together, one feel-good thing at a time. Bye. <laughs> Here we go. Tumble out of bed and stumble to the kitchen. Pour myself a cup of ambition. Yawn and stretch and try to come alive. Jump in the shower and the blood starts pumping. Out on the streets, a track start jumping with folks like me on the job from nine to five. Working nine to five. What a way to make a living. Barely getting by. It's all taking and no giving. They just use your mind and they never give you credit. It's enough to drive you crazy if you let it. Working nine to five. Full service and devotion. Would you? You would think that I would deserve a fair promotion. Want to move ahead, but the boss don't seem to let me. I swear sometimes that man is out to get me. Mm -hmm. How many of you can relate? Working a nine to five. If you're working a nine to five, just trying to stay alive, this episode is for you. Because we're going to talk about how you work hard.